And I've said this before, devils, it's like wolves smelling blood. Sharks can detect blood in the water a mile away. Okay? Any kind of animal that preys on eating other animals, they have senses that guide them to where their prey is. Their sight, their smell, sometimes it, it just, they feel it. I believe that. Sometimes they just, God, God feeds them. God takes them, leads them, shows them where the food is. Packs of wild dogs in Africa. These, and there's, these dogs are beautiful. And these are, they're called African wild dogs. And they're very spotted. They're very beautiful creatures. Have very high pitched almost like children laughing and they always they always hunt in a group and they'll leave two adult dogs a male and a female back with the pups to watch over them and when they go after their food they'll they can take they'll they're very smart. They always hunt in a group. And it's almost like instinctively they know how to surround their victim. Okay? And I, I'm just, I watch this stuff and I'm just, I'm just getting, you know, I'm getting how devils work. And they're very effective. They kill an animal a day, every day. Never, and almost never miss a meal. Almost never miss killing an animal a day, every day. And then the, the big adult, once they capture, they'll capture like a deer, an antelope. They'll have that carcass decimated within a few minutes. They are quick. Their teeth are very sharp, very powerful jaws. And they will rip apart that entire animal carcass and have it eaten in a matter of minutes. It's gone. Like dropping dropping a, a pig in a piranha tank it's gone but then they go back and most of them will regurgitate some of what they ate for the pups they'll, they'll carry it back to the pups in their stomach so when when devils sense your weakness they will surround you like like wild dogs Paul said, the Apostle Paul said, we are beset. That means enemies have surrounded us. They'll, they'll circle us and move in. Okay? And this is where the stand takes place. This is where the stand takes place. You stand. Because one thing, let me, let me go ahead and show you this in Genesis. Genesis 9, turn there. Let me show you what God... Uh, I apply this in the spiritual realm. In Genesis 9, God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. The number 9 is the number for fruit bearing. A woman bears... A child in her body for nine months. There are nine fruits of the Spirit. There are nine gifts of the Spirit. The number nine is the number for fruit bearing. And God says in the ninth chapter of the Bible, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. And he said in verse 2, Here's, here's what God did with the, all the animals. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, and upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. So there is in this world, every beast, every creature, from roaches to flies to mice to squirrels to birds to chickens to fish in the sea, they're all afraid of the man. They, they fear God. They have a natural fear of man in them. They, they can be around other animals all day long and it not bother them. The scent of man shows up and they're gone. Anybody that's ever hunted knows this. 
Anybody that's ever fished knows it. And so what I do is I take this illustration and I illustrate it to Christ is the man that all these beasts that are around us are afraid of. They, they have a fear. Remember when Jesus showed up to Legion? What is thy name? Legion, for we are many. There was, there was, there was a standoff. A legion could have been as many as 12,000 devils, because that's what a legion is. 12,000. Could have been as many as 12,000 devils inside this man. And here's one man telling them, get out. Get out. He stood off against them and they were afraid of him. They said, son of man, why are you here to torture us before the time? Why are you after us? They were scared of him because he was the son of man. He was man. And those beasts were afraid of him. And he cast them into the swine. Swine ran into the sea and they were destroyed. So that's a lesson for you. When these devils beset you, bring the man over. Invite the man over to you. And he will stand for you and run them off because they are afraid of him. Okay? I'm telling you, people, this, this is God's word. This is, what he's, this is good stuff. Amen? All right, let's be dismissed. That's a good lesson. I dare to send you home. Uh, Genesis chapter 2. Let me find my notes. There we go. Genesis chapter 2 verse 18. The Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make an help meet for him. I will make an help. It's not a help meet. There's not one word. It's two different words. I will make a help meet for him. Meet means sufficient for him. It will be his other half. It will be his better half. It will be his, the other half of the way he sees the world. It'll be his counselor. It'll be his guide. It'll be his comforter. I'm not kidding you. With the, the hole that I was in Friday morning, my wife stood up came over, put her hand on my back, rubbed my back, gave me a kiss, and it was like everything just was gone right then. That's the effect that she has on me. That's how God uses her. I'm not making this up. Okay? So, and it's happened multiple times before. So, I need that help that is sufficient for me. I need it. And I'm not going out anywhere else looking for it because I've got it right. I've got it right where I've right at home. She's right there. I know where it is. So verse 19 out of the ground. Now God throws this in out of the ground. The Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. Whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Now, I don't have an exact perfect connection to this, but I see this as a shadow of what God said about all the stars of heaven. The Bible tells us that God has a name for every star in heaven, every angel he has a name. God named them. As God named all of the angels in heaven. God then gave Adam the blessing of naming all of the creatures of this earth. Okay. And in some cases he did a pretty good job of it. All right. So that's that's I see a sort of a connection there between Christ and. The creator naming all of the stars and then Adam being a type of Christ naming all of the creatures of the earth and every fowl of the air. Whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Adam gave names to all cattle, to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found in help 
meat for him. He was alone. God gave the, the rabbits a male and a female. God gave the cattle a male and a female. God gave the snakes a male and a female. God gave the deer, the dogs, the fish, male and female. Even made male and female trees and flowers and everything else. Male and female, male and female, male and female. By the way, this is a lesson against the sodomite issue of God made us this way, we are who we are, and we want the exact same rights as everybody else has, including the right to, to bring forth children. But it doesn't work that way. It, it's not, it does, that's, not how, that's not God's way. God made, God made a male, and God didn't say, you know what, Adam, what, how, what would you think about having another man? That's not what he did. He did not make another man and say, okay, you two, I'm going to make it, go ahead and be husband and husband together. Figure out how it works. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's not, it's not, it's against nature. Okay. But for Adam, there was not found in help meet for him. Did we pray? I don't think we prayed. We better pray. Father, I love you. And God, there's been so many emotions run through my heart the last few days. And I thank you, Lord, for helping me through them. Thank you, God, for blessing me. I, I needed church today. I needed these people. I needed the folks online. I needed them to, to be here with us. Father, I pray that you'd bless the service and bless the teaching of your word. And I'm not, Lord, I'm not smart. I'm not intelligent. But some things, Lord, I just look at it and I believe it. It's, it's just easy for me to believe what you said. So, Father, give us application. Give us administration. Give us gifts. Give us blessing of your word tonight. We love you and we thank you for all this. You, you, we appreciate you, God. We're here tonight to tell you that. We, we appreciate you. We love you, Father. And we are not, we're not those who are going to turn our backs on you. So, Lord, just bless us with your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. So, and I mentioned a little bit of, of that this morning. In that when God picked my wife for me, he picked the one that... He gave the grace to, to be the blessing that I needed in my life. The kind of blessing I needed in my life. Every now and then I need correction. Every now and then I need correction. And I'm not, I'm not the only intelligence in the household. I'm not the only one with a brain. And God gave me a wife that doesn't see things the way I see them. Sometimes I miss things. That she will help me see that I don't see. And over the years, God has helped me and her work out a system where I listen to her. Listen to what she's got on her mind. Listen to what she says. If I don't agree with it, I'm going to pray about it. And I'm going to ask God to either change her mind. God, why, God, why is, she, is she so obviously wrong on this subject? God, why is she obviously just out of her mind here on this? I'll say that, and then, lo and behold, God will show up and say, Mike, she's not, it's you. Oh, God, it is not, you know it ain't, can't be me. Then find out it's probably me, okay? So, I mean, that's just, that's just I needed the woman that God made for me. We didn't know it. I'm not sure that even when we were married that we realized it. But we know it now. And it's a blessing to both of us to have both of us together. And so God looks at Adam. And now I want you to understand this. I've got written up there on the screen, the bridegroom. I want you to understand this, this is typology 101. This is a very simple type in your Bible. Adam is Christ. 
Adam is the son of God. And as, Adam, as God sees that Adam is not, it's not good that the man, he said the man. He didn't just specify Adam. He said it's not good that the man should be alone. Jesus is the man. Now, I pointed that out when we looked at Genesis 9 and how all the devils, all the devils of hell are afraid of Jesus. God put a fear in them of Jesus because they know who he is. They know, Satan is trying to lie to Jesus to talk him out of who he really is. But all the other devils of hell know who Jesus is because when he showed up, they said, what are we to do with thee, thou son of the most high God? They knew exactly who he was. They knew exactly who he was. And they were scared of him. Because they knew what he they knew that he could put them in chains in hell and reserve them for the lake of fire. He knew they knew he could do that. And that they're just biding their time now because he's going to do it eventually. But they're like, give us a little more time here. We're not done messing everybody up. So anyway. The man is Jesus. And God, I believe in this passage, God is looking at his only begotten son and saying, it is not good that my son's alone. He needs a wife. My son, the savior of the world, needs a wife. And I'm going to make him one. I'm going to make him a wife. I'm going to build him a wife just for him. That's going to satisfy him. Now, if you ever want to read a love story, Song of Solomon, best love story in the whole world. That's better than what harlot romances, is that what they're called? Huh? Harlequin? I thought it was harlot. Harlot, harlot romance. It probably matches better harlot romances. Some guy with long hair and no shirt and muscles like this. That's not real, amen. That's not what us men look like, okay? But anyway, if you ever want to read a love story, read the Song of Solomon because in that story, you have, a, you have the picture of Christ and his bride. And there is nothing but pure love between them. There's nothing but absolute companionship with those two. One is as good to the other as the other is to the one. In other words, the woman is just as good to the man as the man is good to the woman. The woman needs saved. The man needs an help. So it's going to work out that while he helps her, or while he saves her, she's going to help him. And it's beautiful. So look at, Gen look at Genesis 2, verse 21. Open your Bibles up and look at this. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. Now, here's the typology. Sleep, always a picture of death. It is by the death of Christ... That the church has life. And the church is the bride. Because our soul is characterized as a female in the Bible. The church then is the bride of Christ. And it's by the death of Christ. His sleep, in other words. So you will sleep the sleep of death, the Bible says. Is because of his sleep. The church then is raised up by his death and by his return from death. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept. He took one of his ribs. I'm going to show you a little bit of symbolism of that. Took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. There used to be this rumor that it's true that men have one less rib than women. No, they don't. A, a woman's Skeleton has 24 ribs. A man's skeleton has 24 ribs. It's the same amount. But now Adam has one less. He has one less rib, but he's got something better. Now you listen to this. There's a beautiful story in this. Whatever God wants from you, let him have it. Whatever God wants to take from you, let him have it. 
God is the one who performed the very first anesthetized surgery in the whole world. Isn't that something? That God knew to put him to sleep, a very deep sleep, so he could not feel the wounding that was taking place by God removing his rib. Because that hurts. You ever get hit in the ribs? That hurts. That hurts for a long time. So I don't know, but what maybe science, medical science, got the idea from the Bible. Instead of operating back in the Civil War, when these Civil War surgeons were cutting up all these Civil War guys who fought, cutting their arms off, cutting their legs off, doing surgery with no anesthesia, dirty hands, all of that. Somebody figured out, why don't we, put, why don't we knock them out? Maybe they won't scream so bad. Maybe it won't be so bad on them. So I don't know, but what somebody read the Bible and said, you know, God put Adam to sleep and did surgery on him. Maybe we ought to try it that way. Okay? That's, but anyway, that's what I see happen. And the rib, verse 22, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. God, God, and the woman is the church, the bride. All the saints together, joined together as the body of Christ. To be, and they're to be brought up to meet Christ in the air. That's 1 Thessalonians 4. That's 1 Corinthians 15. The two passages in the Bible that teach us about the translation and the rapture. It's all going to happen. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Somebody say amen. And, this, and you have a picture of it right here. Made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Adam looks at her. And he realizes what God has done. He says, this is now bone of my bones. And flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And see, you have woman and man. You have the word man in the word woman. And even in the Hebrew, the, the Hebrew here, ish, is man and isha is woman so you have ish in both of them even in hebrew but you have the same thing in english the woman is taken out of the man therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife i left my mom and dad moved out of their house lisa and i got us a place together finally and they shall be one Flesh, And we were our own family together. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. I've taught on that. And what that means is the man and the woman have rights by God. Because they are husband and wife, they have rights by God to be naked with one another and not be ashamed of that and not feel the shame of it. It is not a sin it's not wickedness, it's not fornication, it's not adultery, it's nothing unholy about it. There, it's something that God gave as a gift of a blessing to a man and his wife. And it's to be reserved for a man and his legal, lawful wife. That's who it's to be reserved for. Anything outside... Of, the, of that, what we just read in here, the man and his wife, man and not, not, not just woman, man and wife, she must be his wife before God will allow it to be right in his sight. Anything else is fornication and adultery. Anything else. Is fornication and adultery. They were naked before one another and were not ashamed. They were in pure innocence between one another. There was not the need to cover one another's. And isn't it interesting that the moment they sinned, they didn't cover their entire body. They covered their organs. They covered those up because they realized this, we, I, 
There's just something in them now that we have to cover this up. So they made aprons to cover up their organs. Now, here's the symbolism of the ribs. Turn to Revelation chapter 4. This is, I, there may be other applications of why a rib. Why didn't God use part of the stomach? Because, you know, the way to a man's heart is to his stomach. Lisa figured that out with me a long time ago. She invited me over for roast beef dinner. I'll never forget. I'll never forget it. First dinner she ever invited me over to their house, Sterling Gloria's house, roast beef dinner. She fed me well. I went, I think I like this girl. Then, I, it may have been after we were married, but they made fried chicken one night. And me and Sterling got into an eating contest with those pieces of chicken on that plate. You remember that? I'd reach for one and you'd stick your fork over and reach for one. And when I... and. We didn't, we didn't leave a chicken on the plate. I don't remember who got the last piece of chicken. But anyway. All right. Revelation chapter 4. I've taught this before, but I like the symbolism of this because this is where it fits. And immediately I was in the spirit. Behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. So the heart is the throne. The four chamber heart is the throne. And he that sat... To look upon was like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne. In sight like unto an emerald. That matches Ezekiel 4. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. Now I want you to notice in verse 4. Round about the throne. So the heart. Picture the heart inside your rib cage. And the rib cage is around about the heart. Just like the twenty. You have twenty four ribs. Remember this. You have 24 ribs and they surround the four chambered heart where God's throne is. God sits in the throne of our heart. The Holy, this really is the temple of God. It really is. It matches Revelation 4 perfectly. I mean, in every way. They heard thunderings and lightnings and voices. Let me read that. At verse... Um, Verse 5, and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thundering and voices. Your voice box is right here, right at the upper edge, right just above where your top rib is. That's your voice box. The thunder and lightning is the heartbeats. The heartbeat makes the thunder. And what causes a heartbeat, Ron? Electricity, lightning, boom, boom, boom. When a man's when his heart is stopped and he's at the ER, what do they do? Kaboom! With electricity to get his heart going back again, shock his heart back into operation again. And sometimes it works. But it's done by lightning and it's lightning and thunder in the heart. Out of the throne there were preceded lightnings and thunderings and voices and there were seven lamps of fire. That's the Holy Ghost. The seven bronchial tubes that come down from our throat there's a tube that comes down out of our, comes out of our mouth. You have three holes that breathe. These are the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. The air goes in here, goes, and these three are one because they go into one bronchial tube. And this bronchial tube, when it gets to the lungs, divides out into seven strands or seven branches. Just like the candlestick in the tabernacle. There was seven candlesticks there. And your two lungs, which is, represents the Old and the New Testament, they break out into seven branches inside of your lungs. You literally have the seven lamps of God, which are the Spirit of God, inside of you. Amen. Now, these 24 elders. By the way, look at this. Look what I found. I want to circle this. The word bridegroom or bridegrooms is found 24 times in King James Bible. Woo! You got 24 ribs surrounding the throne of God. These are the elders. 12 tribes of Israel and their heads, Gad, Naphtali, Judah, uh, Levi, Simeon, 
all of those 12 tribes, then you have the 12 apostles. John, Peter, James, the other disciples. You have the 12, you have the 12 tribes on one side, the 12 disciples on the other. That's the symbolism of it. The heart, look up here up on the screen. Here's the, here's the right side. Here's the left side. Uh-oh. Get out of there. Here's the left side. The heart is right here. And here's why I'm drawing your attention to that. I asked God one day, okay, there's 12 on one side, 12. I know the number 12. 12 is the number for God's promise. The promise comes to us as Gentiles in the form of the new covenant with the 12 apostles. But what about the Jews, the 12 tribes? Is God done with them? No, because there's 24 elders. These are the 24 heads, 12 tribes and 12 apostles surrounding the throne of God. This is what I believe the symbolism of it is. So I ask God, who's on the right side? Who's on the left side? The right side is always where the blessing was. Manasseh, or uh, excuse me, Israel crossed his hands to give. He brought Manasseh and Ephraim up and, he, and Israel was supposed to do this to give them the blessing. Ephraim was supposed to get it first. I think I can't remember which one, but he crossed his hands and took the second son and gave him the firstborn son blessing. And the, sec and the firstborn got the second blessing. He who is last shall be first, and he who is first shall be last in the kingdom of heaven. So what I see is the right side of my ribs represent the Gentile apostles, the New Testament. But where's the heart? Center left. Because who does he, who does Jesus really thinking about? So look in, turn to Exodus 28. I want, there's wondrous things in the law. Psalm 77 says. One, I think it's Psalm 77, may be wrong. I, Behold wondrous things out of thy law. Wondrous things out of thy law. So look in Exodus 28. I love this. Man, I love this. Exodus 28, verse 15. Thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. Here's Abe, uh, Aaron. He's the high priest. Once a year, the high priest goes in with the blood of sacrifice to sprinkle it upon the Ark of the Covenant seven times upon the mercy seat. That provides salvation on a temporary basis for one year's sins for Israel. Had to be done every year one year at a time. Christ came, did it once for all. But Aaron had a breastplate when he wore for this one thing that he did. Thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. After the work of the ephod, thou shalt make it of gold and blue and purple and of scarlet and fine twine linen. Thou shalt make it four square. Notice the number four. There's gold, blue, purple, and scarlet. Four square that shall be, be being doubled. A span shall be the length thereof, and a span shall be the... In other words, the span is the hand. It's the length of the hand. It's this big, and it's this big. Square. Four squared means that's pointing you to the gospel. Now look at verse 28, or verse 21. And the stones shall be with the names of the children of Israel, twelve according to their families, like the engravings of a signet, Every one with his name shall be, the, shall be according to the twelve tribes. Now why was that? Verse 29. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his what? Heart. When he goeth into the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. When Christ offered himself as the sacrifice for the entire world's sins. Yes, he's offering salvation to the Gentiles. But where his heart is, is, where the, is with the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. He has not forgotten the Jews. 
And we shouldn't either. Don't replace Israel or the Jews with yourself. God's still got a promise he's going to keep for a remnant, not every Jew, but a remnant of them. He's got salvation for them. He's going, to, he's going to forgive their sins like he's done with you. I mean, in one day, cubby in one day, God took the slate of your sins and went, <laughs> wiped it all clean. It's gone. Forever. Did it just like that. You mean now you're telling me all my sins are forgiven? Absolutely, all your sins are forgiven. But I didn't do anything. I know it. I did. I did it for you. Now think about this. Oh, it was a wound in Adam's side. That's how God made the wife for Adam. It was a wound in our Savior's side. When they thrust that spear in his side and blood and water issued forth. That was the wound given that brings forth the bride the woman of the church for Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. The number 12 always represents the promise that God makes. And God never breaks a promise. Amen. So let me run this through you very quickly. Bear with me, husbands. Turn to Ephesians 5. You know, when I look at things like this, I look at, I remember men like Keith Kettleson. Keith Kettleson loved his wife so much that he moved her down here. He, he had just built his little cabin out in the woods. With a big fireplace in it so he could sit next to his fireplace and throw logs in it all day long. And retired there. And he found out he had cancer. So he said, God, God dealt with him. He said, Keith, what are you going to do? Die? Leave your wife up here sitting up here all alone by herself? Who's going to, tell, who's going to take care of her? And Keith said, God, where do you want me to take her? Take her down to Festus. God put it in a, he told me this. He told me this. Mike, God told me to bring my wife down here so that when I die, you guys are going to take care of her. And I've made it my best effort to keep that promise to that man. He loved his wife. Brought her down here so she could be taken care of. We have a responsibility. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. My wife is watching right now. She's listening to my sermons. Now, she's not listening so that when I get home, she's got a list of things that I shouldn't have said. That's not what she's doing. She's listening to the word of God from her husband. She's being washed by the water, by the word of God. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish Whew. amen uh, there's more here on the bridegroom yeah let me show you this turn turn back to genesis 2 this is the this is the beauty of the king james bible king james bible is the only bible in the world you're going to get this out of and i i'm telling you God didn't have to put this in here like this, but it's, it's like this, it's, it's like this. 
What I'm going to give you is a fact. I'm going to give you a fact. An absolute fact. You can do whatever you want to with it. But I'm going to read to you a fact. I've taught on this before. I love teaching on this. I love teaching on the re relevance of it. Now some say the rib is he took the rib. He didn't take it from the foot. He didn't take it from the top of his head so she could be over him. He didn't take it from the foot so she could be under him. He took it from the rib so that she could be at his side in his bosom. And, and that's good symbolism. I, I, I agree with that. And I also agree with that symbolism of the 12 ribs on each side being a symbol of the promise that God has made. And a promise that a husband and a wife makes that when they join together, they're going to keep their promise to one another. No matter what it takes, they're going to keep that promise. So Genesis 2 verse 21, And the Lord God caused deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept and took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. The rib which the Lord God had made had taken from Adam, made he woman, and brought her unto man. And Adam said, now I, you count these words, you count them yourself. The exact number of words Adam speaks, 46 words, exactly 46 words. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Now, up here on the screen is a graphic of what that verse in its literal application means. The woman in conception gives 23 of her chromosomes, which is the bundles of her DNA. The husband in the conception process is also submitting 23 of his chromosomes, his DNA. And in the fertilization process, those two are cleaved together. It's a miracle how those, that DNA figures out out of the two, the male and the female, and, and there's only 20, there's only half of the woman's DNA and only half of the man's DNA. And I don't understand how it all figures out to work it all out to where the DNA is all lined up perfectly because DNA is like a puzzle. It's got to be pieced together exactly right. I don't understand how all that works, but it works every single time. And when those two br bring forth each 23 chromosomes a piece, that makes 46. That's why there's 46 words there in your king. Isn't that a miracle? I think it's a miracle that out of that statement, there's 46 words there. And it describes perfectly the conception process of the man and the woman joining together and conceiving a child who now has 46 chromosomes. 23 came from his mom, 23 from his dad. And in every child, Courtney, there's a little bit of daddy and a little bit of mommy in her. A little bit of the good daddy and a little bit of the bad daddy. A little bit of the good mommy and a little bit of the bad mommy in her. I don't understand how that works. I got three different daughters. I got a son. They all different. But they're all of us. It, this Bible's right. It's right. God is the one who does that. God is the one who makes that. Isn't that a glorious picture? Amen. Hey, by the way, I want to throw this in. If you count in Genesis 126, if you count the words, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. What I just read to you where it says, and God said, start there counting. Let us make man in our, start counting those words. Those are 47 words. Then, so I've been looking for this for years. I went, well, that's how God made men. How did God make woman? In Genesis 2, 18, God, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make and help meet for him. That's 19 words. Add up not 47 to 19. 66. It's a number of books in your Bible. 
How did God make Adam and Eve? With the word of his mouth. How is God making us every day? By the word of his mouth. The 66 books of this Bible making us both male and female to be the children of God. Woo! It's the happiest I've been in days. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So the things which are seen were not made for the things which do appear. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. That's all I've got. Let's stand for prayer. When I get to the blank sheet, that's how I know I'm done. I don't have any more notes. Stand up.